Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, um, and I hope you enjoyed the morning. I thought it was fantastic, um, and I learned a lot. And I know we jammed through a lot of content, and hopefully you are learning tons and feeling inspired and um, getting the most out of the day, meeting great people and hearing about new ideas. We have an equally awesome afternoon for you. Um, several speakers uh, coming up this afternoon that are really, really amazing. So I encourage you to keep your energy up and uh, see what's coming up. Um, I just wanted to one more time thank the, the great folks at Fidelity FCAT for hosting us at this event today. The space, as you've all gotten to see, is really beautiful. The AV team is amazing. and. Um, We've just really loved being here today, so we appreciate their, their help with the uh, facilities. And then, of course, I wanted to just shout out to our sponsors just one more time. Um, the great folks at Visual IQ, at Point Roll, at Microsoft, at Media Six Degrees, at Experian QAS, and at DataZoo. Thank you guys for sponsoring this uh, terrific day of insight and ideas in the data and analytics space. Um, next up is um, David Rothschild, and besides being a very snappy dresser, David is an economist for Microsoft Research, and he has a, a very insightful presentation for you next about the impending transformation of, my, of market research. So, off to you, David. Excellent. Uh, thank you guys for being here, and thank you guys for hosting us and having me here. So, my name is David Rothschild, and I am at Microsoft Research in New York City. And I'm going to talk today about innovations in indicators and forecasts and survey research. And I'm going to start out uh, by kind of framing this a little bit in terms of politics. And a lot of the work that I've done has been in politics because there's a lot of data there and people find it interesting. Uh, but everything that I do is easily transferred to the world of, of general market research for businesses, for, for economics, for political economy questions, for pretty much all the same tools that we use in order to answer questions about politics we use in business. Politics is just a $6 billion business that's all advertising, essentially. And to give myself a little bona fides and to kind of frame this, this is the forecast that we released, uh, that I released on February 16th, 2012, which shows the likely outcomes of the different states. Uh, for those people who uh, think a lot about politics, you can see there's one state that was leaning in the wrong direction, which is Florida, which ultimately went to the presidency, uh, to Obama. Um, but for the most part, uh, using readily available data uh, and combining them in a, an effective way, it's pretty easy these days uh, in order to make pretty astonishingly long-range forecasts uh, that provide a lot of meaning. And there's a lot of different data that goes into forecasts like that. And it actually is somewhat unique in the world of forecasting uh, to actually combine data effectively in the sense that people tend to kind of become partisans of one data source or another, or they kind of look at them differently, and it's sometimes complex to kind of put things together. But some of the data that I'll talk about today are up on the screen, kind of fundamental type data. This is data that exists uh, without you worrying about what you're forecasting or what you're trying to describe. This is data that just happens on a regular cycle regardless of what you're doing. Uh, kind of social media data, which I'll talk about a little bit. Social media data is obviously quite new to this field. Uh, and it's, it's kind of just on the cutting edge of what you can do with it and what we're going to be able to use with it in the future. Uh, other online data sources that a lot of you guys have access to for your own companies or uh, can be also accessed in the general sense, which is kind of search data, page views, click-through rates, comment sections, blog posts, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of separate that. This is kind of passive data. This data exists regardless of whether or not you're trying to find an indicator or create a forecast. But then there's kind of active data. That's the data that we collect in order to answer questions directly. And so in the world of politics, and the same in the world of market research, uh, there's tools such as polling so, or focus groups where you go out and you ask questions and you gather data to attempt to answer a question. Uh, prediction markets, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, these are, are markets that you can design in which users come in and they kind of bid for contracts that are either worth a dollar if they happen or zero dollars if they don't. A lot of companies have started to to utilize these internally to find about product goals and when, when products can be launched and, and how long it's going to take. Uh, and these markets have proved pretty effective in the past in 
describing the likelihood of different outcomes. And then, of course, experts or other collections of people who provide the data and put it all together. But before I kind of jump in to really specifically thinking about and talking about technology, I wanted to kind of take a step back because what I've noticed working with companies and working also in these public sector type questions is that there's a lot of really low hanging fruit uh, with the technology you already have by innovations which seem almost really simple and obvious once you start thinking about it. And then the first thing to kind of break down is to think why we, why we do forecasting, why we create indicators about what the world is today and what the world is going to be moving forward. Uh, and the first and obvious thing is this business efficiency. Uh, we, we always want to know what's going to happen or what we think is going to happen or what's happening now in order to make efficient decisions. In the world of politics, we're talking about a $6 billion industry. Uh, every two years uh, or so in this cycle was $6 billion. It's all spent in advertising. There's a lot of different places to spend it. There's a lot of different ways to spend it. Exact same thing in any other industry. Survey research is a $10 billion industry. Uh, market research, $30 billion industry. There's a lot of money that goes into this. A second reason, though, and sometimes forgotten, is actually uh, a newer and, and sometimes really insightful thing, which is that as you watch forecast change over time, if you watch indicators change over time, you can learn about the impact of those things we do to change outcomes. So in politics, it's being able to isolate the impact of a debate or to be able to isolate the impact of an ad buy for a company. And the way that you can do that is if you have indicators that move in real time or that are updated very regularly. And they need to be updated extremely regularly to isolate those events that you care about. If, if things are updated on a monthly basis, there's a lot of things that happen in that month that you can attribute to a change in the likely outcome. But if you have forecasts and indicators that update on a very regular basis, you can isolate the impact of the event, isolate the impact of a CEO saying something, isolate the impact of an ad buy. And it's with the modern technology and the modern kind of data flows that can allow us to transform from someone making a lot of hard work to make an indicator or a forecast for a deadline and have one indicator or forecast come out to something that's continuously updating and can be continuously checked and you can see how it moves throughout time. And the third thing is why, why I do this and why I'm excited about it, which is that what we do in creating forecasts, these methods of focus groups and polling and a lot of the data we collect in order to create forecasts are relatively unchanged for a very, very long time. George Gallup invented what is kind of modern scientific polling strategy in 1936, the idea of, of gathering a random selection of a representative group of people, asking them a set, set of questions. Um, and if you froze him in time and defrosted him yesterday, he would pretty much think of market research and be like, yeah, I, I get that. Um, and that's kind of scary because there's very few other things like that when the, the kind of innovations in the business world um, but that's going to change, and it's going to change for two main reasons. Number one is that the old ways of doing things are actually going to become increasingly more expensive. So polling research now has response rates that drop well below 10%, uh, whereas in 1996, we were looking at response rates of well over 30%. Now we're looking at response rates well below 10%. That means a lot more people need to be contacted, and there's a lot more error introduced into the process. On the flip side of that, we have new data streams and new ways of engaging in customers, engaging with people. And once we start harnessing those, there's all sorts of new answers we can have in new domains, more cost effective, we can answer more important questions, and we can do so in real time. And so that brings me to the question of, so we have these different goals that we want to uh, accomplish to kind of answer these sorts of motivations. And everything on this slide is going to seem painfully obvious, but I'm going to give you a few examples so you can see how ridiculously easy it is to improve. The goal of any good indicator or forecast, I kind of break up into, into four things. So when I go to a company or I go and talk to people who do this for a living, I always ask them about these four things and to think about them. And the first thing is to make sure that they're giving the most relevant thing for the stakeholders. And this may seem really obvious that you know, you're, you're generating the right indicator for the right people. Um, but a lot of what we do, a lot of what we provide uh, 
the clients, a lot of what we provide, the people who run companies, are things that have been provided before because we want to be things that they're comfortable with, things that they know. And we're not rethinking, well, well, maybe that's not the most efficient thing for them to answer the question they need to answer. The next thing is this question of timeliness. Generally, we create indicators when it's easy for us to do so or right before something happens. So they're not always fresh when someone needs it. And they're not being repeated often enough for us to learn about how they're shifting over time. There's a lot of things about accuracy uh, that will that are surprising, and most of it comes down to the fact is we don't think enough about accuracy. We think about the most simplistic heuristics for accuracy uh, when we're missing a lot, we're leaving a lot on the table. And then the last thing, economic efficiency, which is that the way that a lot of indicators and forecasts are created for business, for public consumption, et cetera, are very costly. They're very heavily engineered towards specific questions, and they take a lot of time and effort to create and if we can make more economically efficient, we can answer more questions. And so the nice thing I like to highlight about the relevancy is this. So this is uh, from late October, and this was a uh, Fox News, which they were, they were devastated to have to put this up, which showed that the latest Gallup poll had Mitt Romney up 51 to 45. And so this is the most prominent thing that we see in the world of forecasting is the, the Gallup poll. This is the major company when it comes to survey research, and this is their major loss-leading kind of product that everyone sees that they put out into the general public. And so when the general population thinks forecasting, this is the type of thing they think about. This is so confusing and so meaningless in some ways, it's almost startling when you think about it. What does this mean, anyways? Does it mean Mitt Romney's going to win the election 51% to 45%? Does it mean Mitt Romney's 51% likely to win the election? Does it mean that Mitt Romney is leading by a certain percent? This is a single raw data point, a confusing one at that, but it's become kind of the gold standard of what people released, um, at least up to a few years ago. But at the same time, you could go on to uh, pollster.com or realclearpolitics.com, and what they'll show is all of the polls that are released on that given day. And you can see Gallup fitting in there. This was actually even later, so a week later. This is October 28th, right before the election. You see the Gallup poll, which was uh, Mitt Romney up by four points on this day. The exact same time, though, they also created a trend where they, they took all of these polls, they aggregated them together, they saw how they were moving over time, and actually created a little bit of an efficient snapshot. So we moved from a single data point, which people were kind of treating as a forecast. The nightly news certainly was. People on the street were certainly were. Investors certainly were, people who were contributing to campaigns, people who were moving money around to different locations. We're seeing this local Gallup poll. This is what the Mitt Romney campaign itself seemed to be thinking a lot about, when at the same time you have these aggregations. At the same time, though, there's certain things we know about how polling interacts with outcomes. And so on my website, at the same time, you would have seen that the expected outcome still had Obama up ahead for the national popular poll. But of course, those of you who know American politics, that's not how we elect people. We elect people through the Electoral College. And at the exact same time, this was pretty much a consensus among people who were using data in order to forecast elections that Obama was heavily likely to win the Electoral College, which is actually the thing most people care about. You have kind of the gold standard on the left here, and you have what's kind of becoming the thing that people are talking about on the right here. But it seems so obvious that you should create a relevant forecast for the stakeholders. The stakeholders here are people who are donating campaigns, people who are thinking about which campaign to, to, to volunteer for, all these types of things. Uh, but here we have this gold standard that didn't make any sense. People start switching it over. And when it comes to com timeliness, again, this is something that, that seems really obvious, but a couple of years ago, they decided to make a prediction market, uh, a, sorry, a real money market on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for economic indicators. These are a really important thing. People care about them. A lot of decisions are made off of them. And of course, they ran it the day before the indicator was going to be released. And so they were getting these really nice estimates of what the indicator was going to be right before the indicator was released. So for people who were making decisions based off what they thought the unemployment rate was going to be, or the jobs number was going to be, or the housing starts were going to be, there was nothing they could do about it, or nothing meaningful they could do about it, because everything's already been allocated, and the indicator's coming out the next day. 
This is what people have been doing over and over again because it makes people feel good to have a really good prediction. And the way you're going to have a really good prediction is if you release it right before the event happens when more of the information is available. And what we want, though, what we want people to be thinking about is to be a little riskier but actually be more useful, which is to provide things as early as possible, even if they have a lot more uncertainty, even if they're less accurate because that's actually going to be before people allocate resources. And if you update it more often, then they're going to be available when people need them. And it's the same thing kind of to learning about the effect of these events. And if you learn about the effect is if you update them often uh, and you have them early enough to kind of capture the beginning of them. And so accuracy. Accuracy is one we assume that everyone already thinks about. And I'm going to use an example here where I'll compare myself to the most famous prognosticator, uh, which is Nate Silver, for formerly of the New York Times, who's moving to ESPN. But we both put out some Oscar predictions. And you know, on this case, uh, this was for the best supporting actress. We were both right, right? So we both had our highest probability person win. But the actual degree in which you are providing a probability actually means something here. Because if this wasn't best supporting actress, which is for most people, completely meaningless endeavor, but this was a question of when a product was going to be launched or how much was going to be sold, the certainty makes a huge difference. And the size of that error makes a huge difference. And you can see that in things in which we're both wrong for as well, that if somebody gives a much higher percentage chance for the thing that actually occurs, that's going to be a more useful uh, forecast of it. And you can think about this accuracy as a trickier measure and really think about what makes a difference for what your stakeholders are using it for. And it's not just binary if something is right or wrong. It's the degree of wrong and how well calibrated it is and how well it does over time. And these are things in which are just regularly lost even at the highest levels in, in market research. And then finally, I'm going to beat up on Nate Silver one more time, and which is the question of cost effectiveness. Uh, here are Nate Silver's forecasts for these kind of low, meaningless uh, original screenplay and sound mixing, and these are my forecasts. I used a very simple rubric, uh, which was domain independence. So I was using prediction market data and some fundamental data that I was able to calibrate at the same time across all 24 categories, where he was building complex models for each category. When you build complex models for each category, it's very costly for you to add additional categories. When you build something that's domain independent, when you try to use data sources that aren't very specific to the specific outcome, then you can answer a lot more questions. And that's also more useful at the end of the day. New questions, new answers. So now that I kind of didn't even talk about technology for the first 15 minutes, now I'll start talking about data and how things happen with a nice overview of why we're doing it and what we're thinking about when we do it. And so I'll go back to the slide which I showed earlier um, on different types of data sources that I think about. And so these are also, I'm going to go over a little tidbits about a bunch of these different things and feel free to ask questions afterwards or, of course, stop me afterwards if you want more depth on any of these types of things because we don't have much time, so I'll go through somewhat quickly. But this is kind of in the realm of politics on when it comes to the fundamental data. These are the types of things we think about. Um, and same with kind of the social media data and the online data. I'm thinking more about publicly available sources, but of course, uh, these are all types of things that translate over to whatever domain you're in. There'll be similar types of data sources and similar types of streams of data. Uh, and so I'm going to talk real quickly about fundamental data, which is kind of the, the hallmark of how we make a lot of our forecasts. These are things about statistical models. This is machine learning models. These are basically taking data streams that we have in a very regular movement. Um, and we use these to answer a lot of questions. And these are actually the main basis for making political forecasts very long, uh, very early. Same thing with economic indicators. And the problem with a lot of this data, though, is that it's heavily, heavily model driven. You have to continuously update for individual answers. And it doesn't update as often as a lot of people would like. They're very static. And so I'm going to try to talk about some more dynamic and kind of more newer type of things. And I'm going to jump into uh, polling and prediction markets. So polling, many of you are probably familiar with this in, in many different capacities. The standard for polling, and this is the same uh, for, for all, all types of different domains, is that 
these polling companies attempt to randomly hit people who are in a certain market. So in polling for politics, it's a, a random distribution of likely voters. Uh, if this was a question about uh, a company, there would be a kind of random distribution of likely consumers, et cetera. Um, and it's been very effective for a long time. Prediction markets, uh, there have been a bunch of major uh, publicly available markets, but also on the private side, Google, uh, Microsoft, and a bunch of tech companies, as well as Ford and some other kind of more standard companies have been investing in using internal prediction markets, which are just a way of using their own employees to kind of wager on how things are going to go to kind of get some aggregate up information about the likely outcomes for different products or different, different questions. And so I'm going to again kind of show this in how they can uh, compare and contrast in the world of politics. And this is a snapshot of the GOP primary from 2012. And, and some of you could be familiar with this, uh, but it moved up and down for a while. The uh, eventual winner, Mitt Romney, uh, eventually had the support of most of the Republican electorate. But it went Romney, and then Perry, then Romney, then Kane, then Romney, then Gingrich, then Romney, then Gingrich, then Romney, then Santorum, and then Romney. And this is typical of most polling. What they were asking for is the same thing as they ask in market research, which is a question about you. So in this case, it's if the election were held today, who would you vote for? Or would you buy this product? Uh, how do you react to a certain thing? Um, and this is the kind of response that we got because it wasn't talking about the same question that prediction markets were answering. And this is a prediction market-based forecast that we were showing in real time, which is showing who do you think is going to win, essentially. That's the, the question that gets answered in prediction markets, whereas polling is about uh, what you're going to do. Prediction markets base their methods on allowing a self-selected group of people to answer questions about what they think is going to happen. And so you answer two different types of questions, both of them potentially important. Because in the top left, you want to know what your customers are thinking about for themselves or what they're thinking about now, even if we may know that that's going to change after ad campaigns, after people learn about something, after all of the things that you do to influence the outcome. And in this case, that's what this is all about. This is about what we think is going to happen after several hundred million dollars are spent and after Kane has to speak and Perry has to stand in front of a podium for 30 minutes. We know things are going to happen, and that's filling in this. But that doesn't mean that it's not important to also know about that. And that goes back to this question I was talking about before, which is thinking about the relevant question for the stakeholders at any given time. One of these isn't right and one of these isn't wrong. These are two different methods of answering questions. Both of these methods, by the way, can be used to answer either question, but I'm just using it the main usage to kind of highlight how they can differ. Another advantage, though, of markets and other methods which incentivize people to come back over and over again, polling, traditionally, people reach out. And it's hard to incentivize people to just come and answer a poll at any given time. Prediction markets or prediction games are just like polls, but the idea is to encourage people to come back and answer the question whenever they have a lot of information. And so, it's essentially, you could go out and pull uh, people, managers, about the outcome of, say, a product launch. Or if you can create a game, which is essentially the same way of saying, I'm going to pull, but come to me when you have extra information. You feel like your information's really robust today. And what that allows you to do is to have things that move in real time when high information flows are happening. So in this case, we're able to use a mix of social media data to an extent, but mainly prediction markets things that happen very regularly and update to actually see the real-time effect of the debates, to see how much the markets move, how much people are reacting as events are unfolding. And this is what allows us, as I was talking about before with timeliness, to actually isolate the impact of an event, to show if things started at zero, what did it end up in after these major events occurred. Obama had an extremely horrible first debate and he ended up six percentage points less likely to win the election. At the end of the debate, if we had just pulled people a few days before and a few days after, we're not going to be able to really isolate in the same sort of way. Um, so social media data. So social media data 
has a huge amount of promise for two main reasons. And the first is that it updates in real time. It is continuously retrieving information, especially at times of high information flow. Um, and it reaches into tons of different domains. Uh, so regardless of how small or large your company or your question is, the social media data that's talking about a lot of different things, if not on a minute by minute basis, at least on an hour by hour basis that can be updated. But there's been a lot of real problems with how people have been looking at social media data. And I pulled this article as a particularly egregious example of it because they seem to confuse three very distinct things at once, which is quite amazing and very quite common as well, too. So Ron Paul was dominating Twitter coverage during the GOP primary. And he was not only dominating Twitter coverage, he was extremely popular with the coverage. And what happens is, is that uh, people confuse these three things. The interest level in Ron Paul among people who are tweeting, the sentiment about Ron Paul among people who are tweeting, and a prediction of what's going to happen in the GOP primary related to these things. So if you think about interest levels, sentiment, and predictions. And these three things are very distinct and very meaningful all of them meaningful for different stakeholders at different times, but they shouldn't be conflated together. And that's what they did here when they talk about Ron Paul being popular and being talked about and also confuse that with something about maybe a likelihood of him doing well in this primary. This came out by Topsy right before the Oscar nominations. Um, I have absolutely no idea what this means. Like, I, I, I've looked at it over and over again. It got tons of page views. It's really pretty. People were following along it. I, I think it may have something to do with sentiment and interest levels. It certainly has nothing to do with who's going to win. Um, but people are, are loving to jump into this data to play with it and see about it. And you have to sit there and think about two things. And the first thing is, what questions can you answer? And a lot of the stuff that we're learning about social media data now is that it doesn't answer the traditional questions. But it answers important and meaningful questions that we're not used to being able to answer. So whereas we really want to use it for predictions, and we can in some capacity, there's still standard methods that are better and more efficient. But it answers tons of questions about what people are talking about and their sentiments surrounding it, although you should be very weary of any sort of sentiment index as you see at this point still. But let me give you an example of why it's so difficult. And this is something which I, I put out with Bing during the 2012 election. It was looking at how much uh, people were talking about the two candidates during the election coverage. And uh, for those of you who are familiar, this is on a log scale on the left, on the y-axis. And so what this means is that uh, each of these bars is times 10. And so during the first debate and during the Democratic primary, uh, Democratic nomination process at the DNC, uh, in the second, third debate and whatnot, uh, there was about 100 times more people talking about presidential politics during those few hours than there were during any other standard minute or any other standard hour. And so what that, that means is that at any given time, you're just talking about one one-hundredth of the type of people who are there. That's one thing. But also, they were talking about different things. Uh, they were talking about things in a different way. They were maybe providing links differently. They were talking about both candidates versus one candidate. There was a just shift in sentiment about kind of how they were referring to candidates. Because what happens is during a general discussion, uh, people are more likely to be talking about their own candidate during the times of high intensity. They're might, more likely to actually reacting to the events that are happening on the screen. And what this means between a very different type of people and a different type of question is that if you have some sort of index that runs from October 2nd to October 3rd when this first debate happened to October 4th, it's like you went out and you asked 10 Hungarians a question about the general election on day one, and then you asked a thousand Americans a different question on day two, and then you asked like nine French people a totally different question on day three, and you're trying to run an index that kind of compares how things have changed across that time, you're going to miss something. And you're going to miss something 
uh, about what it means. And this is the kind of things that we're, we're trying to overcome and the things that we're working to change by actually learning a lot more about who's on at given times and adjusting for it. But these are some of the challenges that are still ahead for social media data. And so I have like two or three more minutes, I think. So I'm going to add one or two more things here about uh, kind of some of the other things we're working on. But I think the key thing as far as innovations in, in market research is what the next generation is going to change. And it's going to be about harnessing all of these people who are on the internet, harnessing these people who answer internet polls, harnessing your clients in a non-random, non-representative way and actually making a talk. And we're doing it through kind of like four main points, which I'll say, which is number one is incentivizing those people who actually have information to come to you and provide information when they have it. Number two is asking new questions, actually just even simply just asking new questions, but also using graphical interfaces with those questions, which are able to grab a lot more data from people. It's using new methods of aggregating up the data so that rather than taking simple averages, you know how to reweight people and sample from your responses to actually get meaningful groups of people from completely random or kind of non-representative looking people. And it's incentivizing people to provide the information that you want, which is truthful or meaningful. And I'll give you a few quick examples. Uh, we did this polling on Xbox from the 2012 election. We got several hundred thousand people to respond. And based off some research we did before, we knew that you can just ask this very simple, different question to people, which is rather than asking people who they intend to vote for, asking people who they expect to win. And we have shown historically that if you ask the questions to the same type of people, the same people at the same time, and they disagree. So if more people intend to vote for one candidate and expect another candidate to win, uh, then most of the time the expectation is correct. We saw that with Xbox, totally non-representative group of people. We asked people who they expected to win their home state, and 50 out of 51 states pointed in the right direction. Simple question on a completely non-representative group of people. Similarly, we show using graphical interfaces, we can get people to supply back really complicated data, full distributions of different things that we had shown them. But more importantly, and I'll say one more thing on this Xbox, is that by harnessing a huge amount of people and asking people in a panel type format, we're able to answer questions which most people can never answer, which is exactly how people were switching their support over time. Whereas a regular polling is always done, it's just a separate cross section. You never get to see when people switch and change and actually learn about that moment, which is very rare, and how people rarely switch companies or switch things that they support for, and actually then break down what it meant. And one of the key things that we're able to show in this is that very, very few people actually shift to support during election. It was a lot about people shifting in and out of whether or not they took a poll, which is somewhat related to whether or not they're going to go to the polls on election day, but it's not necessarily. And also that most of the movement is actually going, people going back and forth from saying they're not going to vote for a major candidate and a major candidate, but it's just vanishingly rare that someone switches late in the cycle from one candidate to the next. So I'll leave it at there and, and take questions. Hello? Oh, good. Um, this is really interesting. I, I, I'm interested in the what you mentioned about self-selected. Um, there's, and I understand you're you're going uh, you're canvassing a huge uh, audience. You know, as opposed to the random uh, sample size. Uh, what you know, there's the typical question of what you know. All the people that are responding to your surveys are well exercised and understand what you're doing. So you've kind of trained them. So there's a loss of, there's a bias built into that. I'm wondering how, what you think about it. And then the other question is, what about that? those people that chose not to be part of that survey, what do they think? And do you do any kind of counter check on that? Yeah, so let me give you three quick things on that. And the first thing is, is that biases will definitely happen. People will learn about the way you're providing the survey. They'll learn how people are using it. And the good thing is, and the most important thing, is that if people do that systematically over time, you can de-bias those out. So statistical models will help you kind of eliminate uh, that problem. The second thing is, is that one of the things that we're working on and one of the things that are very important and meaningful in what we do 
and what the new technology is going to do with polling is standard polling has had the idea that each person is an individual kind of separate domain and they, they act independently as far as how the data is responded. When you start using the data more appropriately, what you say is that every person is a bunch of different data points. They're white, they're male, they're in a certain age group, they're from a certain location. And you use that data to help inform other cells which may not be as prevalent in your responses. So you, what you're doing is essentially saying that uh, you know, all white people have certain, certain traits or certain likelihood to answer certain responses. All people in certain age groups do. And you can actually create from, say, taking five demographics, what we did in this Xbox thing is we turned it into 6,500 different cells. Some cells are actually empty, but we still did a very good job when you compare it to the standard polling functions because we allowed everyone to inform on, on kind of everything. And, and the kind of the last thing I'll say is that the reason, the way I kind of entered all this is I'm an economist, actually, which is a kind of rare way of doing this. But I came in from studying markets. That was what my classical training was. And in markets, we always rely on a self-selected group of users for the high information. And we know markets have done a great job for generations in providing pricing and providing answers to questions. And so I was, then I kind of looked at polling, and I was like, this is really weird. Um, we are obsessed with the idea in, in economics about just getting self-selected people with a lot of information. This whole polling industry was designed to never do that. And I was like, well, if we can do it in markets, how come we can't mimic that kind of advantage here? And, and that's really what we're trying to aim for with a lot of my research. So you mentioned that uh, those 6,500 groups, how do you choose those groups? How, how does that happen? Yeah, so um, one thing which I should have mentioned before is that none of this is possible at all to kind of to move away from standard polling functions. Can't happen without some baseline information. Um, and so when it comes to market research, the ACS, the American Community Survey, uh, the, the current population survey, the census, a couple of these kind of key yearly or uh, kind of bi-yearly type of, uh, of functions are extremely important to kind of center exactly how we're, how we're making those decisions. So in the case of politics, you're looking a lot at exit poll slash current population survey, which gives us key demographic breakdowns in their interactions. And we're mimicking those things, those things that we know some certain outcomes for. And so um, there's always going to be a place for the traditional, very traditional kind of revealed polling type structure. And that's going to provide the baseline that allows you to jump out and answer all these other questions, but with that understanding. And then the second thing is that history is going to help us too. So with that first question about bias is that once we start doing more of these over time, seeing outcomes and calibrating the outcomes, you'll be able to work it the same way that we've been able to do um, in all sorts of other machine learning type tasks. No, that's, a, that's entirely right. Um, but there is, there can be a trade-off. Um, and it, there's a trade-off between kind of all four things I was talking about. It's getting the most relevant thing for people, getting the most accurate at any given time, making it cost effective, and, and being timely. Um, and the first thing I would say is that a lot of people are stuck in old methods that are just simply more expensive and don't provide any extra accuracy. Um, but uh, these are all things you just need to think about with the stakeholders at the end, end, end game because, um, and it's also a lot of it though is really about fixed costs. And so when you're thinking about setting up new methods of harnessing your data, it's thinking about all the different main outcomes you may care about at the end of the day and it's doing it right in the beginning and it's thinking about being as domain independent as possible from the start is going to allow you to then make more accurate and more predictions down the line more forecast online, and that's one of the things that I see over and over again when I talk to companies and when I talk to individuals who do this, is that they're so focused on that first answer, or this first type of things, uh, without thinking about the long-range goals, and then it becomes extremely costly to pivot from there.
So um, especially when it comes to social media data, a lot of what we're doing now is a lot of, well, A, first natural language processing, and B, kind of machine learning um, in the capacities of, say, for social media data, starting out even just trying to learn about the demographics of people. And so in order to do that, it's a lot trickier than we would think in many ways. It's about taking names of people, it's taking the people that they're related to in different network streams, taking the different things that they've watched or talked to or shared, and trying to then determine main demographics from them from a few sets of baseline information. Uh, but then the really tricky stuff comes down to is thinking about the questions the social media data answers. Um, and when you're doing that, it's a lot about sentiment. Uh, and I'll give one example is that, and why I'm very weary of any sentiment models. You see uh, that sarcasm is just like the hardest thing in the world to figure out when it comes to 140 characters, right? And so, you know, we're trying to, trying to work with that and trying to see, like, can you start pivoting on that stuff, answering that stuff? Because otherwise, what you're seeing is a lot of things that are actually throw out a huge percentage of the responses in any given thing. So maybe people are looking at social media data and trying to give you a gender breakdown, but they may be dumping half or three quarters of the responses, and you have to worry about what that's correlated with. Geography, you know, most people don't reveal where they are on Twitter, so we're trying to use different ways to kind of break that down or other, other data sources, but it's hard. And so we, fortunately, working for Microsoft, we have some ground truths for some things that we've done, and we try to use those in order to, to learn and then make those answers. And I'll say one other thing, which is kind of tricky that we've been playing with recently, which is not even just sarcasm. It's figuring out, just thinking about this in terms of the technology, but in 140 characters, like, what are they even talking about sometimes? Like, we were really lucky during the election that uh, uh, Obama and Romney have really clean names, but that's not always the case if, if Smith is running against Thompson and you're trying to determine how much people are talking about these candidates or, you know, in companies like Apple, you know, it's a, people could be talking about apples. Uh, you know, there's all these types of things. These are kind of games which you're trying to play. Even on the most simple level, uh, become very tricky. Uh, thank you, guys.